Welcome back viewers. Uh, thank you so much for tuning in to my channel. Uh, my name is Patrick Tawia Matope and uh, on this channel I do deliver content on social work. Uh, anything to do with social work mainly um, when uh, you know for those who are practicing uh, with children and families. Uh, if you are new to the channel, please do subscribe uh, and hit that notification bell so that when I post next time, you'll be the first person to know. And if you are a retainer to the channel, thank you so much for retaining and watching. Uh, please do watch up until the end and also do share the video. Uh, and I hope you like uh, the content that I'm delivering on this channel. Uh, so today's topic, I'm going to be talking to you about the 12 tips. Um... When, assess, when risk assessing and also when care planning for unaccompanied asylum seeking young people. Uh, for some teams, they usually call them UASC. UASC, uh, that would be unaccompanied asylum seeking children. But obviously, increasingly, we see that most of them would be young people, basically. So I would usually, I mean, I would end up saying unaccompanied asylum seeking young children, really. Uh, so it's really important to make sure that when doing these risk assessments and also this care planning, you conduct a thorough risk assessment of their needs or a thorough risk assessment of what it is that you think they may be at risk at and also a thorough assessment of their needs so that it informs your care planning. Um, so in terms of the risk assessment, it needs to be identifying what I would call the potential risks for these unaccompanied um, asylum seeking young people. Uh, so that you're able to actually tailor, make a care plan or a support plan which is in line with the risks that they are, that are presenting in that, for, for that particular or for that individual young person, really. Uh, so, first and foremost, uh, the most important tip that I'm going to be talking about would be around safety and well-being. So, it's important when you're risk assessing to make sure that you include issues to do with their safety and their well-being, uh, you know, upfront. Uh, you need to look at issues around their physical safety, their mental health, as well as their emotional well-being as well. Uh, as you know, some of them may have come through a very traumatic, um, you know, um, you know, traumatic experiences. They have come through maybe traumatic experience of them coming into the UK. Um, so it's important for you to make sure that, you know, their physical safety is taken into account. If they have any injuries, they need to be seen immediately by the doctor and everything. And uh, if there are issues around their mental health, you need to be making sure that you've put in, you know, necessary support for them to be uh, to be supported and uh, also in terms of their emotional well-being. Uh, so it's important for you to consider the history of trauma or abuse that they may have suffered as well as uh, possible exploitation while it's on their way coming to the UK, really. You also need to evaluate their understanding of the local laws surrounding, you know, this kind of support and, uh, you know, the understanding of the local laws, you know, in terms of them actually comprehending what they went through and the fact that, you know, if it's something which they need to be reporting, they need to be doing that straight away. You also need to talk to them about their rights as well as their responsibilities. That's point number one. Point number two, uh, you'll be looking at issues around accommodation and the environment in which they will be living. If they've mentioned about exploitation and possible individuals in a specific area, then you need to know that you need to be avoiding those specific areas. And if possible, you may need to look at accommodation, which will be a bit far from uh, those individuals that they may be uh, disclosing or indicating that they exploited them. Uh, or something like that. So you need also need to make sure that the accommodation which they will be taking is suitable for their needs, suitable for their needs, you know, in line with their religious practices or cultural, you know, um, uh, cultural practices and all that. So you need to make sure that uh, you actually do assess whether the environment is conducive for their well-being uh, if they get accommodation. Obviously, we all know in social work that you can't place a child without actually seeing exactly where they are going to be living. So you need to be making sure that they are comfortable um, in their own environment. Um, in terms of accommodation, you need to be looking at things like privacy, hygiene, and access to local amenities, um, how accessible are the local amenities, things like the gym, things like the community library, things that you, you and I will be using on a daily basis, really. So that's tip number two. Tip number three, uh, you need to be looking at um, a theme around education and employment. 
because remember some of them when they do come over here they will be at an age where they are able to actually work so you need to be looking at um, issues around education and employment so that they don't become uh, what we would call NEET, NEET as in N W E T, not in employment, uh, not in education or training. So you need to be making sure that you assess their educational needs. What were they doing when they are, when they left their country of origin? Which level of education were they? Uh, what sort of aspirations are they having? So that you start to link them up with appropriate, you know, community resource, resources. If they want to do an apprenticeship, you need to be looking at the vocational training centers or the colleges which are around uh, so that you can actually uh, point them the right, you know, in the right direction in terms of um, training or employment opportunities, really. So you need, also need to identify if there are any barriers uh, that they may face in accessing this education or these work opportunities. Barriers could be issues around their papers from the home office. So you need to be making sure that you arrange appointments with the solicitor so that they can start that they can kickstart that process of getting the application to the home office if they are obviously seeking asylum and once they get their papers they will be eligible to work and you also need to advise them not to work when they are not supposed to be working because obviously before they get their papers they are not expected to be working so they will be uh, getting support from the local authority or they get they're getting support uh, from the placing authority um, so you, you need to be advising them against doing that because once they, they do that they may actually hamper their chances of getting their papers in order so the fourth point is around social support and integration some of them may come into the country knowing one or two people from their you know country of origin so you need to be making sure that they've got the support that they need in terms of them settling in uh, in terms of them integrating into the community you need to make sure that they you have given them maximum support uh, for them to be to be settling in really um, the other most important point is um, legal and immigration status. I've already you know, talked about legal and immigration status. So you need to make sure that you understand their current immigration status and you're able to support them accessing a solicitor who is able to support them with the application to the home office. And once that comes through, you know, talk to them about their rights or make you know within that appointment the solicitor will be able to actually explain to them what their rights are and if the english is not their first language usually obviously all of them english will not be their first language so you need to make sure that you arrange an interpreter so that they fully understand what it is that they are getting into and what it is that they need to be expecting their rights their responsibilities as well as um things that they should be expecting really so that's really really important you also need to make it clear to them that it doesn't necessarily mean because of them coming to claim and seeking asylum, everything should be hunky-dory and everything should be perfect as it is. There are also some legal uncertainties that they may be able to face and uh, you also need to look at the uh, potential emotional or you know potential uh, impact on their emotional well-being with regards to that. It's possible that they might seek asylum but their papers may be rejected for one reason or another so you, they need to be prepared for that. And so it doesn't necessarily mean because they've put in an application it needs to be honored by the home office and they are going to be getting um, you know a response, a positive response really. Point number six is around health and healthcare access. So you need to make sure that they're registered with the GP, they're registered with the optician, they're registered with the dentist. And uh, if there are any health conditions which are pre-existing, which you are not aware of, uh, you need to have a conversation with them around that to make sure that they are actually seen and they are evaluated so that they get the support that they need in terms of their health. Uh, because we wouldn't want a situation where, uh, you know, they are put at risk only because we haven't actually gained information around their health and their health care needs, really. Um, so that's really important. So when, when it comes to health, there are also specific issues uh, or specific health needs around vaccinations and mental health support. So you make sure that they are also getting the support that they need. Remember, we spoke about the journey being you know a traumatic one sometimes. So it's really important to make sure that they are supported uh, fully. Point number seven is around the risk of exploitation and trafficking. So as you know, some of them, they do come maybe through Calais, you know, in the trucks or whatever it is that they use or through um, the boats or whatever it is that they use. There is a risk that they can continue to be exploited even if they've come into the country. So it's important for, you know, to have those conversations around them to try to find out whether this is something which is, you know, going on for them. Uh, there is also a possibility of criminal exploitation. They also, even once they come into the country, they will always be indebted to the gangs or organized crime uh, bosses of wherever that they would have um, 
you know, got support from for them to be coming into the country. So it's something that we need to be identifying, you know, those vulnerabilities and uh, also identify those vulner vulnerabilities that they may expose them to, you know, further exploitation once they settle into the country. And you also need to assess their own awareness of the potential risks, uh, you know, associated with them being exploited and, you know, obviously prevent further exploitation from happening. So we need to be linking them up with protective services that will actually support them in terms of possible further exploitation that they might go through while they are in the country. The other important thing to consider also, point number eight, is family reunification and some support networks. This links up with point number six, which I spoke about earlier on. Uh, if they've got any extended families, you know, friends around, you need to be linking them up with them and also consider a possibility of family reunification. If they've got any family member or anybody else around whom they can actually go and live with, that will be their choice. While they still claim the asylum, there's a possibility of that. They can still get the support while they are in that particular place. So we need to be, you know, assessing those existing support networks, both local and abroad. It doesn't necessarily mean that if they've left their parents in Afghanistan or Iraq or whichever country they or Zimbabwe, wherever they've come from, um, it means that, you know, they can't talk to them. They can still maintain those links and make, because usually, usually it helps them with their mental health as well. It also, it also helps them with them settling. So it's really important to make sure that uh, they actually establish and they maintain those uh, networks as well. Um so this will help them, obviously, with their emotional well-being and uh, especially longing for and, and, and the, the possible longing for family connections. So you need to make sure that this is put in place. And then point number 10 is around financial independence and budgeting. This is really, really important because this may link up with the possibility of them being exploited. Once they have settled, they are getting their allowances. You need to make sure that they are getting, they are using their allowances, you know, sparingly or they are using allowances for what they are supposed to be using. Or otherwise, they might still be sending money to whichever organized, you know, gangs that, you know, would have brought them into the country and stuff like that. So you need to make sure that, you know, all that areas are also covered as well. So it's important for them to, um, you know, for you to make sure that you have evaluated their financial literacy, they understand the prices in the shops, you know, obviously if, they are first, if it's their first time into the country, they need to be taken to the shops. So you need to make sure that the support workers or the place where you, they've been placed are able to support them with things like budgeting, financial literacy, and uh, also, you know, assess them, you know, their abilities to actually manage finances and actually make savings as well, if it is possible. And, um, you know, we need to provide them with the appropriate guidance in terms of them being financially independent. So that's really, really important. Point number 11 is around cultural and religious considerations. So, um, obviously, if, for example, Christianity is their religion of choice or Muslim, um, you know, if, if they are, you know, Islam is their religion of choice, you need to make sure that you put that support in place and they're able to access uh, the mosque and all that as well. So it's really, really important to make sure that that happens as well. Um, so... Point number 12, remember, you know, risk assessments, uh, when we do risk, risk assess young people, uh, this needs to be tailor-made to each and every young person. It doesn't necessarily mean that you've done a risk assessment of one, pay, one, one young person and their care plan, you know, you can actually replicate it to the other young people because the presenting needs might be different. One young person may come in, you know, addicted to drugs already or one person may, young person may come in addicted to things like cannabis. So you need to be making sure that you tailor-make the risk assessment to suit the risks presenting with that particular young person or you tell her make your care and support plan to suit the needs of that particular young person that you are dealing with. And remember, this needs to be reviewed now and again to make sure that it remains relevant to that particular young person and it it, 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 it is actually supporting that young person in terms of the support that they need rather than you know leave it being an open-ended kind of you know risk assessment or an open-ended kind of care plan really remember the care plan that you we are talking about is something that we, is gonna you know is it's it's it's, it's 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 something that's gonna be used almost on a daily basis so you need to make sure that this is reviewed either on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis and make sure that it speaks to what it is that we want to support that young person with. With those few words, I hope you have managed to grab something. Um, and thank you so much for watching until the end. If you haven't subscribed, please do subscribe and hit that notification bell so that when I post, you'll be the first person to know. Thank you so much.